in old fashioned technology. For 12 years, I'm going to tell you now why we're giving Peter Phillips the award. Peter Phillips has headed Project Censored at Sonoma State, and he's been the heart, soul, and public face of one of the most important media criticisms, organizations, and programs in the history of American journalism. Every year, working under a production schedule and deadline that I can't even imagine, he comes out with a project censored book of the 25 top stories that you should have been able to read in the corporate media, but you didn't get to. Project Censored digs up the news stories that have been very carefully buried by the corporate press. Every year, Project Censored reveals the truth about a world often left in shadows, and they are the stories that we all have to know in order to consider ourselves actually free. Um, I just want to tell a story uh, about Peter's Project Censored, the year that we had the award ceremony and book party release at Fordham. We had the East Coast release, and we decided we would have a conference since we had these brilliant journalists who were receiving awards, and we would really get them to talk to students, and we scheduled panels and a whole two-day conference called Free Press, by the way, in the year 2000. And um, Peter was rear-ended by a tow truck uh, and very seriously injured, so he didn't get to come, wasn't unable to come to the conference that we worked so hard on. But he did send me seven of his students and staff members from Sonoma State. And they arrived in New York um, early one morning and decided that they had never seen New York in Manhattan, and they took the train down to Manhattan and stayed there all afternoon and into the evening and into the night. <laughs> And so some of the students actually missed the train home. So they stayed in Grand Central Terminal for most of the evening. <laughs> I don't remember if I told Peter this. Um, so they got back to the house and got a little bit of rest. Then, my husband's not here so I can say that, they listened to my husband about how to get down to Lincoln Center on the subway where they would save money instead of using the Metro North train. So they were all about 15 minutes late for their own panel. <laughs> Um, but it was really a great conference, and I think the most important thing was that the students did have fun, and also everything turned out okay because Peter sent me two bottles of the seven deadly zins from the Phillips Winery family. So you see, everything works out in the end. <clears throat> now, Peter may seem to you like a mild-mannered sociology professor, and he certainly is a, a, a soft spoken yet highly effective activist as well as scholar, as you see from his latest work down here that he has given to us. It's a draft, but um, Peter's work is always uh, very well researched, very well argued. Uh, in addition to putting out the book once a year, frankly, I don't know how he does it. That's why he's getting an award. Um, but he's also had to fight some pretty tough battles, though he seems like a mild-mannered sociology professor in kicked back Northern California. Some people find it hard to believe that Peter Phillips really doesn't like censorship. <clears throat> Even if people want to talk about taking down the Twin Towers and who did it and possibly it was done at the highest echelons of our own government. So Peter has taken on courageous uh, stances uh, throughout his career, throughout his 12 years at Project Censor. We're very proud of him. We're incredibly pleased that he has come to receive the award um, and I would like to all have a big round of applause for Peter. <laughs> I want to show you all the fantastic award that we're actually giving him. It's really nice. It says the Union for Democratic Communication, Peter Phillips, the Dallas Smythe Award, in honor of the famous legendary political economist of media, in recognition of your contribution to critical communication studies and alternative journalism. Thank you. Very much. Peter, or I won't hand the microphone over because it doesn't seem to work.
Thank you very much. Thank you much. I, accepting this award is really accepting it for Dr. Carl Jensen, who was the founder of Project Sensor 33 years ago, and over a thousand students in that time, probably 1,500, who have done the research work every year for. What am I doing? Okay. Have done the research work every year for the past 33 years, and at least 200 of our faculty at Sonoma State who help evaluate the stories each year. So. It's a collaborative effort, and so certainly uh, there's time schedules and a lot of work, but I certainly can't take credit for it all. In fact, there's at least a dozen people working on our 2010 book right now, um, which is due in two weeks, and five chapters are in and 10 are still pending, so it just kind of all comes together at once, and we hope that that works every year, and it has so far. But uh, the 2009 book is, is, has been out since last fall, and it's like an almanac. We'll put it a year ahead so that you can still think it's current on 2009, even though the research is a year old. But uh, the stories are, are consistently important. And when Project Censor started, um, 1976, there were, according to Ben Beck Dickian in his book in 83, 50 major media corporations that ran the media in the United States. And Dan certainly knows this. And in that time, it's gone down to, to 10, who are very, very consolidated, very interconnected. And since 9-11, what we've seen is not only continued media consolidation, but the consolidation of the biggest public relation firms in the world as well. So Omnicom, WPP, Interpublic Group are the ones that have merged and taken over many of what, what we knew of um, Helen Nolan and many of the uh, PR firms that were the mainstay of government propaganda and that are now consolidated internationally with 176,000 workers and people all over the world and really creating what corporate media is using as news for, for the most part. So <clears throat> corporate media is irrelevant to democracy, like Chesney, and it's irrelevant to working people in the United States. It's there for entertainment, and it's there for keeping us like mushrooms in the dark and feeding us a lot of you-know-what. And there's probably nobody in this room that doesn't know that already. That's why we're here. But the stories that, that we identify each year have this consistent theme of not talking about what the powerful are doing. And that's probably, if we look back, people say, well, what, what, what's your most favorite story? Well, there's a lot of them because it's really about the policy elites and the, and the policy councils and the government bureaucracies and in the private corporate bureaucracies, not in the United States but around the world, that are pushing the globalization agenda, pushing the privatization agenda. And there's no discussion inside of corporate media because corporate media, they are this global elite. So when Danny talked yesterday about the military industrial complex, which is the Eisenhower terminology, essentially, um, military industrial media complex. It's really a military industrial media empire, globally. And I think to take that word complex and put in empire translates to the, the military dominance of, of, of the United States worldwide with a thousand bases, wars in multiple places, and being the weapons providers for the world and the military corporations, which are part of this, the core of this system of power um, in the United States. So when we look at media, um, we don't have to look very far to find uh, William Kennard from the Carlyle Group sitting on the New York Times board, or Douglas Warner III from Bechtel sitting on NBC's board, um, or John Bryson from Boeing sitting on Disney's board with uh, Alan, Alan Lewis from Halliburton sitting on Disney's board as well. Or Douglas McCorkendale from uh, Lockheed Martin sitting on Gannett's board. So the interpenetration of the military industrial community inside of media is, is well developed. And so this is part of the reasons that we're not getting the stories that, that are most significant in, in the world today. So here's a quote from Chris Hedges. You know, he wrote, 
he covered the Gulf War for the New York Times back in the 90s, he said, the notion that the press was used in the war is incorrect. The press wanted to be used. It saw itself as part of the war effort. Truth-seeking independence was far from the media agenda. So our number one story in the 2009 book is about the civilian casualty rate in Iraq since our invasion and occupation. There's been three national surveys, um, two done by Johns Hopkins University, one in 2003, which set the civilian death rate at that time at 100,000. And these are, these are surveys, like Yellow polls. You go into a family, you interview them, and say, Has, have you lost anyone in your family due to uh, war-related actions? And 100,000 in 2003, 2006, 600,000. And then we have Opinion Business Research Group out of Great Britain that did a survey in 2007, uh, 2,400 families in 15 of the 18 provinces throughout the country, and came up with a figure of between 900 and, and a million uh, civilian casualties, 900,000 and a million. So that's three national studies. That was completed almost two years ago. So we're well in excess of Dr. Mullah saying 1,300,000 at this point, uh, civilian deaths because the United States invaded Iraq. Now these are deaths over and above the civilian death rate that had been evident under utter Saddam Hussein. And that was high because of the sanctions. So these are a million people that have died because we invaded their country. And half of those deaths are because of direct US military action, either aerial bombing, and this is where Michael Schwartz kind of disagrees with um, uh, some of the earlier studies. And he says, well, he thinks it's more of the home invasions because of the surge. And it probably is more recently. But half those people died just because of US direct action. So that's a half a million people. It's, it's a tremendous amount. Now, Downing Street, after Downing Street covered this in July of 2006, they were the first ones to use. Um, 2007, they were the first ones to use the, the million dead Iraqi term. Alternet had it in September. Um, Alternet ran another story in January of 2008. Democracy Now! did a story on it in January of 2008. Um, Interpress had it on March 3rd, 2008. The Nation magazine came up with it February 16th, 2009. Um, and Bush War totals, it was John Terman from MIT, a statistician there, research scientist, who he validated the numbers and said, yep, a million dead Iraqis. That's it. And it took even the left progressive press over a year and a half to really cover these numbers. And only partially, many of the left progressive haven't, haven't addressed this at all. And corporate media, zilch, zero, none, no coverage at all. Yet these, science, these are valid scientific facts. There's, there's absolutely no doubt that there's been at least that many people killed. And we're left wondering, why won't they cover this? Why won't they put the pictures of, of the dead? Most people in the United States think the one poll was something like 50,000 Iraqi deaths, maybe 10 to 50,000, mostly Iraqis killing Iraqis. I mean, that's the impression that we get when we talk about people's understanding of what's happening over in Iraq. We're there as peacekeepers, and we're just trying to prevent these fanatical, radical, misminded Middle Easterns from killing each other. And, and that's the impression. And nothing could be further from the truth. And nothing could support an anti-war effort greater than to, to be able to see these deaths and to have an understanding that, that it's in our name and that we're, we're totally involved in this. And it's because of our policies because of the United States empire that these people are dying. Now, that leaves us with a, with a real moral problem. How do we address these issues? What capacity? I mean, we, we put this on the front page of the Project Censor websites in our book. Maybe a few million people will see it. Um, and, but that's the only, it's, and maybe they'll see the Nation magazine story and think, oh, wow, there's some agreement. But no, this is, I mean, this is not mass public. This is not people understanding the, the levels of, of 
catastrophic levels, the genocidal levels of death that we're doing in the world. So some of the stories this year reflect this. They reflect that of Congress, 150 members of Congress have over up to $200 million invested in the top 10 defense contractors. That's a third of Congress directly invested in these military machines. Last year, lobbyists spent $3.2 billion lobbying Congress. So when we talk about money and power, the military companies are right in the middle of that, and the health companies, and, you know, the, the, the policies that we're seeing, the top-down policies uh, that we're seeing. Obama is the only president ever in U.S. history to keep the same Secretary of Defense or War from an opposing party. It's never happened before. And then his whole thing about we're going to, you know, no lobbyists coming in. The first exception <laughs> is William Lynn, who they make Deputy Secretary of Defense. Now, William Lynn was Clinton's controller. He's the one Rumsfeld was talking about on September 10th, 2011, uh, 2001, when they said, well, they've lost $3 trillion in the Pentagon. And then, of course, 9-11 happened and nobody ever talked about it again. William Lynn, after he left Clinton administration, went to work for Raytheon. He was vice president of government relations. He spent $6 million last year lobbying Congress on behalf of Raytheon and other defense contractors. So he's back in now as deputy secretary of defense. So if you think we're going to have a different empire policy under Obama, you're wrong. It's not going to change. In fact, the budgets are up. Now we have a kinder, gentler face, and maybe we'll get national health care and we'll all be mandated to buy insurance under the new liberal Kennedy program. But that's not challenging the real evil of this empire. It's not challenging this military domination of the world. And this goes back, I mean, that's, if you look at the Project for New American Century, the PNAC documents, that's what they're saying. Forward deployment, U.S. domination of the world, containment of China, um, continued accelerated spending. We're, we're on plan. We're on target. We're continuing in that direction. So that's some of the macro stuff that we don't, that we don't hear about. We don't hear about Brzezinski's success in the State Department. Secretary of Treasury, the Ambassador to the United Nations, the National Security Advisor, the Chairman of the Economic Recovery Committee, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, Assistant Secretary of State for Asia and Pacific, and half a dozen others all came out of the Trilateral Commission. They're all members. There's only 84 people in the United States who were part of the Trilateral Commission. The rest are Europeans and, and Japanese and Asians. So you got this small group of people and the Rockefeller-funded Trilateral Commission for International Planning, and 11 of them are in the current administration. So that's the Brinsky, that's, that's that interlock of, of where we're going, and no difference. So when, when we talk about this stuff, and we realize the extent to which we don't know what the powerful are doing, we don't know the interconnectedness of this, we're faced with what we've been using this terminology, a truth emergency in the United States. That we have a serious truth emergency. Now that, we had the first Truth Emergency Conference in Santa Cruz a year ago, January. There was about 400 activists, Danny was there, it was about 400 activists from all over the country came. And these were people who had a lot of different agendas. Election fraud, 2004 election, the, you, know, 12, you know, 9 million votes didn't ma match the voting machines and the exit polls people who were concerned about the lies about Iraq, the, the war and peace people, a lot of peace center people there. Not a lot of 9-11 people were there, people who were concerned about the, the lack of <clears throat> real scientific review of the collapse of Building 7 or the pre-warnings and, and all of that stuff around 9-11. And <clears throat> activists around um, electromagnetic weapons, just a variety of different people whose issues aren't in the media. 
That was kind of the shared the commonality of why we were there. And one of, the, one of the actions that we talked about that day was, well, who do we trust in terms of media? We know that corporate media isn't doing the job. Who do we trust? Where do we go? And so you know, part of that was to build a site of independent media that has what we think collectively trustworthy news sources available online, these are RSS feeds, and there's, I'm sure there will be people that disagree with a lot of, you know, some stuff on each of these, but the Christian Science Monitor, Free Speech Radio, Consortium News, BBC, Bayview, IPS, Democracy Now!, Al Jazeera English. There's 19 daily RSS feeds. The guard, so you click on one, you get, the, you get the paragraph that starts the thing, you can click through and see the whole story, NACLA, Electronic Infotata, News Trust. All independent, no, no corporate media here. Daily news, you print it out, it's 50 pages plus, and changes every day. And it's a place where students can go to identify independent news sources and, t and talk about them. So we're getting you know, classes now where they'll actually keep a journal, pick the story that they think is most important for the day and uh, write about it as part of a communication study or sociology class or whatever. And I think we think this is just a start. It's very part of it, part of this whole system is to engage universities and get p classes and students actively looking at independent sources of news, validating those so sources of news. And we actually have a, on that site it, it, over here, it's called Validated Independent News, but it's going to switch over probably this weekend to a whole new site uh, called Media Freedom International that will have validated feeds from independent researched um, news sources from colleges all over the world. We now have 30 affiliate universities, some people in this room, who, who in their classes can evaluate independent news stories, go to a professor in political science or physics or whatever to, to check out the facts, and say that this is a validated news story. A professor puts their name on it and says, yes, we think this is a valid story. And it goes up as independent news. So we think that there's a very important role for universities to play in this movement, this media democracy movement of validating independent news stories from around the world. And there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of bloggers, independent researchers, news sites, magazines, independent sources, mostly online today. That's been the biggest change since I've been director of Project Spencer, is that historically the left press was, and it, well, even the right press, nobody was online, now everybody's online. I mean, when I first started, like maybe a quarter of the sites actually had websites. Now everybody's got a website. And that's multiplied, there's many more. So we have this capability of interlocking with independent sources all over the world. Some of the language translators under Google are pretty okay. We actually were trying Chinese out last week, and we translated a piece into Chinese and then translated it back, and it was pretty close. It was pretty close. So <clears throat> that ability to find independent activists and, and interconnect using universities as a base because the biggest problem with independent media is they all get to go to conference together and they try to figure out how they can survive and make money doing what they love. And they're having a hard time at it. So it's like we need a day job. They teach me, I get paid to teach sociology classes, but my real work is this. And I see a lot of head nodding. I mean, this, this is why you're here, is we want to build this kind of media democracy in the world. We want to have openness. We want to be able to challenge empire from the bottom up. And we're tired of the top-down control of corporate media in terms of how we think and what, and what we're engaged with. So when we say there's a truth emergency, we mean that seriously. And we took that terminology to the Media Reform Conference in Minneapolis last year. And we surveyed, we got a random sample of 10% of the people that were there. Of the 3,000 people there, we got 375 surveys. 98% agreement with the word truth emergency in the United States, 98%. Now, granted, I mean, that's, a, that's a, an audience of self-selected people, but that's an agreement that it's not just, 
not just a problem, it's not just corporate media not covering certain things, that we have a real emergency here with our, with our way of thinking in our society. That, you know, 85% of the people, the young people don't read newspapers anymore, so you got all the kids under 30, it's either television news or website news, and most of the website news is MSNBC and Fox, that's where they go. Because they're not sure how they, who they can trust anywhere else. It is a raw story, a good, a good source. You know, what about alternate? Well, there's a man the two left ears. I mean, you get, that's where the role of universities and professors and classes doing research can come to play. That's where we can be able to validate independent news stories and also do our own investigative research about what the powerful are doing. Now, I've left a, a paper up front. It's entitled, An Invitation to Expand Investigative Research in Independent Media. And it, I'll just read a little bit of this, and I'm supposed to wrap up pretty quick here, I think. Public colleges and universities have a role to play in global media democracy. Universities are institutions that are found on scientific factual research, sharing the results of this research with others, both within specific disciplines and outside the academy. As corporate media continues on a path of entertainment, declining support for investigative reporting, and watered down news reporting, an opportunity for colleges and universities is emerging to take a role in validating independent news and doing investigative research for publication of independent media sources worldwide. So the research that we could, we're doing at universities this past semester, I have a course called Investigative Sociology, 17 students. We monitored using, we used <clears throat> Nexus Lexus, Factiva, and ProQuest. We looked for newspaper stories in the United States on law enforcement related deaths. We used the word cop, police, death, shooting, suicide, a um, number of different terminologies. We have documented close to 800 law enforcement related deaths in the year 2007. We have those all in newspaper reports locally. That's twice what the FBI says were killed. And, <clears throat> and we interviewed 15 families who had lost loved ones in the San Francisco Bay Area from a law enforcement related incident. The commonalities of their experience are almost eerie. Multiple departments, they were all lied to about the incident. They're all convinced that it was unjust. There's some that believe, you know, that their loved one was certainly doing something wrong and maybe threatened the police and they were acting in defense, but most of them do not see it that way. And maybe that's to be expected in terms of being a family member, but none of them, none of them had an obituary. There were no obituaries. If you get killed by the police, you're demonized. The paper demonizes you, the families demonize you, you get coverage. There's no obituaries on those people. There's a shame. There's no, there's no support, the community turns away. So those kinds of stories, that kind of validation, that kind of interviewing is what social science does, what we, what we have the capabilities of doing. And it puts a human face on the victims, but it also talks about the difficulty. We interviewed 15 police officers as well. You know, and certainly their side of it, it's, it's very important. But this level of, of shootings, I mean, we shoot more people per capita than any, literally any place else, any industrialized nation. And that's just, that's just the one semester research study that a couple of criminal justice professors and I will be writing up and working on this, this summer and fall. But any class is capable of doing those kinds of investigative work. We, we, documented all the who, the, who the owners of the insurance companies and the board of directors of all the health insurance companies in the United States two years ago. Their profits, 38 billion, uh, 118 people. They in turn sit on the boards of directors of like 250 independent corporations in the corporate 1,000. This is, you know, corporate America interlocked. They contributed to every presidential can candidate in 2008 except the Senate. He's the only one that got no money from anybody on, on health care. Single payer, exactly. So there's work to be done at universities that is collaborating with the, the need and the undermining corporate media. We can build an independent system of news 
using independent sources, using websites like this, about using sources of our own, creating our own websites, doing our own publication, feeding this. You can do a whole newscast daily on any radio station in, in any community in the country just from, from these sources and, and, and be pretty confident that they're trustworthy. So we don't need corporate media. It's irrelevant. We don't need to be on primetime television. We can do it ourselves. And that's the underlying message that I'm going to continue to say, I believe in, and I hope that you can help us carry that torch onward. Thank you very much.
released the autopsy reports on civilians who died in U.S. custody in Iraq and Afghanistan two and a half years ago. There were 44 autopsy reports. 23 of them said the cause of death was homicide, that we tortured these people to death. Their, their bodies were horrendously mangled. And then the other ones died primarily from heart failure while being tortured. So here with absolute proof, ACL puts out a press release, AP picks it up, it goes to all 1,700 dailies in the United States, and 12 papers ran the story. The biggest thing in the LA Times on page 84, and it ran it once. And it's never been talked about again. All kinds of stuff about torture, but nothing. The only place it appeared was in the movie Art Taxi to the Dark Side. And they talked about the autopsy reports. No coverage. Absolute proof of the report that people dealt with the bodies. We had medical doctors saying, yeah, they were killed, unfortunately. So the former media won't cover it, and, and no independent press didn't cover it either. It was one of our top ten stories that year, and it, got, it had zero coverage. Literally. I think in these times, it did a couple of us. We have to start it now. So, I mean, we've got a real problem when, when something that obvious is just completely left out of media in general. That's where, if universities can validate and say, yes, this looks true, I've read the autopsy reports, I've got to look at it, validate these are sources, and use whatever resources we have in terms of independent media out there, but only these stories out there, then we'll give more credence to that in a very challenging way. And I can't explain why they didn't do it. You think, well, editors want to do it because it's unpatriotic or whatever, but uh, we know that that happens, yes. So brief response to that, and then an actual question. Um, I, I think the, the key is not just us turning off the corporate media, but getting other people to turn it off. Because they have power, corporate media has power because average people watch corporate media. So that's the key. My question is, um, what are your thoughts on creating new media outlets? It seems like there's just so many, thousands and thousands online. Um, especially with, you know, I see the necessity of a local but it, it really seems like resources are too spread out. I was just in Fairfax about a month ago. They've got a new 10,000 watt station coming on the line up there. We're about a peace center in the peace community. They have a very active press, and they've got a full website, and they're totally engaged in a military city. And that, I mean, that's happening everywhere. The National last the month before, they got a radio station, and that's an, yeah, across, across the country that's kind of been happening. You know, the FCC is trying to prevent that. I mean, there should be a thousand hundred wires, not a hundred. And, um, you know, that kind of communication ought to be available in every community. Let's say Caracas in, in, in Venezuela, I think, where it is, independent radio stations. Corporate media is owned by the big elites in, in Venezuela, have been and continue to be owned by that. In their place, there's 400 independent radio stations in the barrio spread throughout Venezuela, run by community councils in each neighborhood. And that's media from the bottom up. They, they have 34 analog television stations that they broadcast from in the barrios, and you can get them for radios. So that's a, that's a different media model. And certainly we have that capabilities, and we have the internet to share that, and we have university capable people can look at facts and, and, and issues that we can validate and say that this story looks important and true. And we can check our sources. And we do that as a collective movement that it becomes um, an independent source of news that is validated, the rest is entertainment. Now, if we see corporate media as entertainment and we get our kids to think that way about us, we're not going to say, oh, they'll, they'll turn it off. Let's take a second look in terms of the, the values and the, and the issues that are being played for us. That's the that's different game. Um, <coughs> I have the 1997 Project Censored Video. Oh, the, the video. Yes, yes. yes which I, I, and I don't, so one question is, have you done others? Will you be doing others? It's still, even though that's like 12 years old, it's still, it really it's has a cosmetic story impact, gets the kids, uh, for sure. to the other yeah. things. And, and the other question is, um, just listening to the, after the idea that validating the uh, independent uh, news or, just hearing some of your comments of the, um, you know, like what you were talking about with the law enforcement examples. Do, do you on Project Censor have somewhere like guidelines for, um, you know, it's... How to be an affiliate, how to validate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would, 
It's, it's going to be on what we're going to call the Media Freedom International site. This is my last year doing the book. I'm doing 2010, and then I'm not going to do the books anymore. Dr. Ben Franker, who's, who's a sociologist in liberal studies at Sonoma State, will take up doing the annual. He's going to do everything I did. Right. But our foundation, which is Media Freedom Foundation now, is engaged in trying to build this expansion and get more universities involved in doing this. We now have 30 affiliate universities, and um, I'd like to see 300 in the next couple of years. And, and it's just sharing. It's just taking a look. You know, our number one story was done by Elliot Cohen's class at South Florida University this year. Another one story this year is how the Wall Street banks are, you know, influencing really big you know, the White House. So it's, it's that kind of sharing. <coughs> What do I have in terms of working class and workers and workers' struggles? No, but I mean, do you have links to websites? I'm oh, sorry. Do you have links to websites? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, um, about, let's see, there's, on the right hand side, I think it's, there's the corporate ownership, archives, internships, sign up, independent news sources. There's like 700. Yeah, it's all there. There's a project sensor. 
block now. You can post them now. And, uh, okay, so we're hoping that there'll be more on that. I have a little question about teaching. Um, and I'm noticing more now than I've heard, you know, as you know, was talked a bit about yesterday, that there's a sense, I think that, and like you were saying, that there's very little faith in commercial corporate mainstream media. Uh, the problem that I'm seeing is that, I mean, I mean, kind of along the lines you're saying, like, just don't watch the stuff, just don't read the stuff. The students that I'm working with right now are, I mean, they don't know what's there because they are so, that they're so turned off to it, so they're not engaged with it. But then at the same time, they're sort of oddly obsessed with this idea of objectivity. So it's like, you know, if you, you give a sort of critique of, of the news or say, you know, these are things that aren't covered, you know, as, as obviously. Um, there's kind of this like, well, I want to hear the other side. Um, and I don't really want to work around that. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, I'm working with journalism students. And in undergrad, I was, I was a journalism major. And so I was kind of hammered with that, like, you know, get your, get your multiple sources from two sides. Like, how do you deal with that in communicating, like, this is true if there's a, an agenda that you have in telling this truth, but it, it is true. So. I'm like a 19 year old Orange County woman that's never seen anything other than Fox News and Boston News. <laughs> and you say, okay, take a look, follow this story, and or read this, take this story on anybody, and read it, come back to class and, and report on it. Then she's very 25 years old and report on it. Within three weeks, I mean, five disciplines are going to set in. That you know, you're going to have, you're hearing these stories often for the first time that are just shocking in many cases, whether it's carcinogens in your cosmetics that you use on your body, or it's, you know, the world water situation from Monte Barlow, or it's 